Hi, I'm Kenneth Wajda. I'm a professional photographer here in Colorado. Welcome to another one of my photo talks, photo walks. So, hey look, I'm back on the red couch. So I thought today would be a good day to start a series of photographs where we go out on the road and make some photographs together. Because half the fun of photography is actually doing the shoot and I've been working on figuring out how I can bring you along and easily go out and make a photograph with you. But it's always a little bit of a challenge because you have to both shoot photographs and make video, but here we are. So this is the first in a series. I find for myself, I have a hard time making photographs unless I have a goal or a plan. So my plan is to make photographs that are part of a project. When I was out photographing different local parks and the people playing in the parks back in 2018, I was making a project as a result of the New York Times Summer of 78 project. And I like when I go out with a goal and a purpose because it gives me a focus of where to shoot. I sometimes struggle with just wanting to go out and shoot, but I don't work well without a project. And so, this project that I'm working on is basically Main Street, USA. I live in an area where there are a lot of little towns and most of those little towns have small downtown Main Streets. So my goal is to photograph one iconic Main Street from each of those towns and create a series that I can put together for a gallery project and It'll just feature different main streets in different areas nearby. There are towns down out to the east that are small old farming towns out in the plains. There are towns in the south and in the west that are more mountainous and certainly uh, some old mining towns. And I think it would make a good project and it'll give me a place to shoot since I tend to be a people photographer and not really a landscape photographer or a person who wants to shoot a lot of architecture but I like main streets and I like the simplicity of everyday life and maybe we'll find some people walking down main street that we can include in the photographs so I'm going to get in the car take you along we'll go out and make some photographs and hopefully this will be a regular series that we'll just learn how to take the camera for a ride and maybe sometimes we'll shoot the Rolleiflex, maybe sometimes we'll shoot 35, but the idea of the 4x5 is it gives the photo and it gives the process more time to be created. And I think that's what makes, when anybody says, why do you shoot 4x5 when the phone is so much easier? I don't necessarily want it to be easier. I want it to be thorough and fun and I want to take my time with it. It's almost like not wanting it to be over too quickly. I don't want to just, for this, point my camera out the window and say, okay, I got one. So I'll take you with me. We'll see if I can make these kinds of videos on the road and if they're informative and hopefully somewhat entertaining and we'll see what we find. So come on, let's go. Put on your shoes, put on your coat. Okay, so this is day one, shoot number one. We're going out to photograph a small town. And then the question is, what town should we shoot? So I was thinking I may as well just go and shoot my own town. The first town, sometimes it's hard to photograph what you know best, like my town here, it's difficult to know what to photograph because I see it all the time. So sometimes it's harder to see what it is. But I thought maybe it would be good to do shot number one, just set up in my own town and find one portion of the town that to me says, this is a good representation. What you're including here in this shot, this is good for what would you say is Longmont, Colorado. So let's go, we're real close, we'll be there in a minute, and then we'll see what we think. And also, I'm getting to try out this whole driving video system, which I've created. So that's kind of a fun thing too. 
See you in Longmont. Here we are in downtown Longmont, and I'm going to do a little quick walk over to see what I can find for a good vantage point to photograph from, because I want a photo of the downtown, but I want to get a good foreground. Foregrounds are important to me, and we have to make it so that something is worthy of being in the foreground. And as I go around this corner, I'm actually just off of 3rd Street, and you can see that one building in the back, that's the Dickens Opera House. That's like an iconic building for this town. But the other side is kind of in shade, so I have to think about what would be best for getting that photograph. And then also, when I get over to here, I'm looking for a foreground. If I were to come down this little hill and shoot. But there's one thing I notice is that inside the street, there's this wet pavement that doesn't look all that attractive to me. And I was wondering if I could get it shot in such a way so that this bench ends up covering it. Again, those are the kinds of things I'm thinking about. What can I use for a foreground element that might be a good element for putting some kind of a feeling of depth into the photograph? If I go any further down this way, I don't think it works any better for me. I think that the best shot, then I start to almost feel like I'm losing a feeling of the town. But the town is up over my shoulder, and I need to go and find a place that best suits documenting the one iconic shot for this town. So I'll go set up a camera. We'll set up a field of view and take a look through it and see what we think and see if it's the shot that I'm looking for. Now I could come back midday and then the light would be across both sides of the street because the light is in such a way that it's right now east to west but this town runs north and south. So we could come back, but I don't really want to shoot it in midday light if I could help it. So that's what we're working with. This is downtown Longmont, and it'll be interesting to see what the final photo choice becomes. So let's go set up a camera. OK, so first let's look at what we have for camera gear. This is my Wista DX that I'm really, really happy with. It's a, cherry wood camera that I picked up at a local yard sale, state sale, and it's a Wista Field DX. That's in here. There's also a light meter because you can't go anywhere shooting large format without a light meter. And this one is a Minolta Autometer 4F, so it does both flash and ambient light. Great little meter, nice and lightweight. This is in there. It's my cable release. You can't shoot without a cable release when you're shooting large format because what's the point of setting up all that gear and then having everything kind of be shaky because you push the shutter without a cable release. I only carry two film holders so I can only shoot at the maximum four frames and today I'm probably only going to shoot one frame. Maybe two. This little bag is a little old Olympus bag that came with an XA, I'm pretty sure. And this has a loop in it because sometimes you have to critically focus. Not sometimes, every time you have to critically focus. You see that beautiful bus is sending me a nice fill light. Oh, I like that. The loop gives me a critical focus for when you're making a large format photograph. And I also have an extra level in here in case I want to do a double check with the level. And there's also an extra cable release in there. Sometimes if I put this in my pocket and I forget to take this with me, this saves me a trip back to the car. I'm usually pretty close to the car though. And then this camera lives with a 150 millimeter G Claron Schneider lens on the lens on the camera, in the camera, folded up. But I also bring two other lenses with me, which are, since this is the first episode, we'll talk about the different lenses that are with me. This is a 90 millimeter Schneider Super 
Angulon 5.6, so it's a wide angle lens, so I can shoot, it's like a 30 millimeter would be in a 35 millimeter terms, full frame terms. And the speed of the lens only helps you focus. It really doesn't matter all that much for shooting because I never shoot wide open. I'm always looking to stop down. I'd like to shoot down at 64 if I can. And if the subject allows it, I want maximum depth of field. I'm looking for a critically sharp photograph. So the 150 that's on the camera is like a 50 millimeter lens, a normal lens. And then I have this one, which is a 210. And this 210 is like a 70. So I have like three focal lenses, a little bit wide, a normal, and a little telephoto. And those are the only ones I have for this system, for this camera. And they're the ones that I keep with it. And this is on a extended lens board that I had put on for an ebony camera. And I just left it on there. And it adds a little bit of extra space to make it easier to focus. But I think it would work OK without this. But it works on the ebony with this. So I ended up using it on both cameras with the I don't think it's called a recessed lens board, so it must be a protracted lens board or something like that. So those are the lenses that I have with me. I'm probably going to shoot with the 90 or the 150 today. And I like to look through the camera to make my decision. And then the last thing is the drop cloth that goes over the camera. I love this one. This one I picked up online somewhere. It's the kind that's got a little bit of elastic so it can go over the camera and stay on and not fall off. And it's white on one side and black on the other. And it makes it light, nice and lightweight and rolls up really easy. Fits in the corner of the bag. And this whole setup then goes into this bag, which says men's department on it. It's a leather case that I picked up at a thrift store for 5 or $10. and. I think it was a showcase for some kind of a men's lotions or something. And it was just an empty case when I found it. And I like the fact that it was leather and it had pretty nice straps on it. So for low budget, it became a great all-in-one holder for my Wista 4x5. And then here's the tripod I've been using. I use this whole this tripod for the whole 4x4x5 four by four by project. And it's a little Bogan 3025, 3205, not 30, 3205 tripod, which isn't the greatest tripod in the world. It's kind of small. And it's got this little 3265 ball head on it with a squeeze grip. And that's it. It's not the heaviest tripod, but the camera isn't all that heavy. And the things that I've been shooting, I haven't been worried about wind or I guess with the heavier tripods, you can use heavier cameras. But I don't have a real heavy camera, and I like the simplicity of this. And when I'm shooting, I keep a quick release on the different cameras that I have. And so I can literally just pop that on here and have it ready to frame up and work with. So let's go frame up something, and let's see what this town looks like through the camera. OK, so here's my tripod. You can probably see the corner of the bench. And I'm going to work here where it's super loud, but it should make for the best vantage point. And what I'm going to do is this is all ready to mount. OK, so this is just on a simple quick release. So I can just pop it on here. And then I already opened the camera, but I'll quick show it to you how it did it. One of the things you have to be careful with with this camera, which we won't probably show at the end of the video, so watch it now, is you can see the bellows are a little bit crinkled on the sides. That's because somebody didn't fold it up right, and that's why I got a deal on it. But when you go to fold it up, you have to press this part in, but you have to loosen all of these so that it's free to fall wherever it wants to fall. And then when you push these two levers down, this will fall down. And what it does is it wants to fall into its own place. And ideally, those bellows would be perfectly folded. And then when you push these two down, there's a little indentation that they fall out of. 
this would move forward and back and seat itself where it was supposed to be so that it would be perfectly folded. If ever you buy a Wista DX, watch and see if the bellows aren't misfolded. And once you get one, if it doesn't have bad folds in it, be careful with it because it will want to sometimes if it develops the incorrect fold, it'll keep that fold. So basically, once you put the camera on the tripod, then this automatically locks into the 90 position because of an indentation in the rail. And the same is true for this one. This one automatically knocks it, locks at 90 degrees. And then you can still use rise and tilt and lock that up. Remember, when you're opening and closing it, you have those four open and completely free of any tension so that it has the ability to fall where it wants to on closing. Then it's got these two locks here. Once you bring it to the forward position, wherever you might need based on which lens you're using, you can lock it in that position. And then this also has a lock here. If you want to swing it, you can swing it from this front area. I don't use that a lot. Sometimes you might use it if you're shooting a long line of buildings. I definitely use rise and fall a lot. So I'm going to set up the camera and see if I can use this foreground of this bench somehow to create a feeling that brings me into the view of the town. But I'm not sure exactly what I'm going to see. I just need to take a look. And I still have the 150 millimeter lens on. It'll be possibly necessary to put the 90 on so I can get more foreground, but I have to look and see what I have first. It's really handy to have close focus because it allows you to see without having to put on glasses. I can just pull my glasses up and off. And when I'm under here, I have the glasses up and over because that allows me to see. So with this view, I could try turning the camera vertically and I might be able to make it work, but I don't see any of the foreground right now. Now the way you make a view camera vertical is you just release the back and you turn the ground glass. So I'll do that and take another look and see if I can make the 150 work. I might need to go a little lower. I might need to go a little bit further back. It could work. I would like to use the 150 if I could because I really just like that lens. I like the results that I've gotten with it. So let's take a look at it now. Obviously the lens is in the open position. I think I must have left it in the open position at the last time I used it. That's a common thing for me is I leave the lenses in the open position. Now um, I'm liking the traffic lights, but it doesn't have enough foreground. So the first thing I can do is I can try lowering and seeing if I can get some of the bench this way. And I can, but then I lose the traffic light. So the only thing I can do is bring the camera down much lower. So I'll lower it down one section. I'm not a fan of using the center posts for anything because I find that it makes the camera feel like it's kind of top heavy. And the center post for me is kind of like something you use only when you must use something. Okay, so you can see I've lowered the camera much further down. And now what I'm trying to do is get this foreground to cover up the debris in the street, the leaves, the snow. So let's take a look through here now. So I think I like the composition. It's a vertical. It showcases a little bit of this foreground. It has traffic lights. It has buildings. It has bright afternoon sun. The one thing it does is this is a black and white photograph. So I'm looking for big graphic elements to hopefully make it so that we can get a sense of this town in black and white film. So strong black and white tones.
Now I need to use a loop because I have to make sure that it's in focus. There's no point in making these photographs if you're not going to focus the camera. And it's really fascinating. You could think that you're close to focus and then you check it with the loop and you see it, you're not. You can see it's out of focus and then the loop, you're able to fine tune it. So this is a peak eight times loop. I like it. I used to use it for slide film back in the day. It's a simple one. You can find those and I recommend it. I'm gonna put, since I didn't bring out the other cable release, I'm gonna screw this cable release into the lens and make it so that I have the lens ready to go when it's time to make the photograph. Now the one trick you can use to make sure you never waste a piece of film is fire the shutter before you pull the dark slide. Because that guarantees that the lens must be closed. Because if you didn't close the lens, you can't fire it. And that has saved me, that little tip has saved me so much film because it's important that you don't put the film in, pull the dark slide, and the, you forgot to close the lens. Now, so I'm able to use the Schleimflug <laughs> That's a great word. I'm able to use the Schleimflug method to get it so that the bench is in focus and the building. The bench is only eight feet away, but the building is 40 or 50 feet away. And so by using a little bit of front tilt, I'm able to make it so that both are in focus. So the one thing the view camera does really well is it allows you to change the plane of focus. And the way I've always learned it is you focus on the near and then you tilt for the far. So let's do that. I need my loop. I am tilting the camera to focus on the near, which is this bench. And I'm just ballparking it at this moment. And then I'm using this to focus on the far. And then I do it again. So what I'm doing is I'm finding how to make it so that, I need to pull this back just a little bit. So I've used a little bit of tilt to make it so that I could get the bench in focus and also the building. The bench is only eight feet across, or eight feet away, but the building is 50 feet away. So by using a little bit of base tilt, I'm able to get it so that both are in focus. Now, the traffic lights don't look in focus, and so that's where depth of field will come in play. I'll shoot it at an F64, and hopefully they'll be in focus too. So as we talked about before, you fire the shutter, it won't fire until you close the lens. Then you can set it and check it. Now it works. So now I can set it again. I can put the film in, but I still have to figure out exposure. And I haven't done a light meter reading yet, so I need to do that. Now my light meter is great because it's an incident light meter. So all I have to do is hold it in the same light as the building. But that's a problem because the building is in bright light and I'm standing here in the shade. And this gives me a reading of a 90th of a second at F8. That doesn't do me any good because I'm not even close to what light there is over there. So. Knowing I'm using 400 speed Burger Pancro 400, I'm going to guess. I'm going to guess because it's probably, I can tell by Sunny 16 what it's going to be. 
So I don't really need an exposure meter. I need to understand how light works. So let's say I was shooting 400 speed film at F16 at a 400th of a second. So I'm going to put this at, instead of F16, I'm going to move it to 64, which is one, two, three, four stops, stop down below F16. So I need to open up the shutter to a slower shutter speed. So instead of 400, I go to 200, to 100, to 50, to 25. And I'm probably going to go to 15 because I know that I'm going to be in a situation where I want a little bit of overexposure to make sure the negative is dense enough and then that the shadow side of the frame also gets some light. So I'm going to go with a 15th of a second at f64, which also happens to be a very common exposure that I've used a lot when I've been shooting 4x5 in this Pancro 400 in bright light. So this is a 15th of a second, F64. I double check that I'm at a 15th of a second and that I'm stopped down to F64 because you can forget to do those. You can think that you're going to do them, but never do them and then you don't get the frame. Then I make sure the shutter is set. I make sure the lens is shut, and it has to be because we tripped the shutter. And now all I need to do is pull the dark slide. And then wait for the moment to shoot. And I think right now would be a good one. And there it was. So now I went from a white side of my dark slide now i turn it to put the black slide out and that lets me know that this frame was already shot and i'm able to when i take this out of the car next i don't accidentally shoot the same frame twice which could happen if you don't remember hey which one of these did i shoot what is that why is there one why are they both the same after i shot one i know i shot the one with the black side out so the white side is ready for next time. And I don't feel a need to shoot two of these. I think that film and film costs, if I thought there was some reason that wouldn't work out, I would shoot another frame, but I don't think there's another reason. So I think we're done for the day. We just have to process this film, take a look at it. So let's head to the lab. So here is the final photograph and I'm quite happy with it. I feel like it really captures a sense of what downtown Longmont feels like and looks like. And it's a big little town and it feels like a big little town. And I love the blacks. I love the foreground is dark and how the bench leads you into, leads the viewer into the frame and brings you to that bright Dickens Opera House, which is the cornerstone, iconic building, part of what defines Longmont, Colorado. So overall, I was happy with the shoot. I enjoyed working outside and bringing the camera out there. I think the video worked out okay. Since it was the first time, I'll have better sense of how I can film even when there's loud motorcycles and cars going by because really the audio was able to pick up very well and I wasn't fighting trying to wait for a break in traffic. And overall, I was really happy with both the shoot and the light and the exposure was right on. The negative looks great. and. That's a good example of how Sunny 16 really is that accurate, that it's always the same because light doesn't change all that much. Light isn't going through 
different changes on different days, light is mostly always the same. And you can guess exposure if you don't have a meter based on Sunny 16, I use that so much. And I'm even able to use it with four x five. So I processed it yesterday at 10 o'clock at night, HC 110 with nine minutes of development and it's Burger 400, Pancro 400. And I love that film. I love the blacks. I love the way it works with tones. And HC 110 is my go-to for black and white processing. And I think that's a perfect negative for the start of this project. So I'm really excited to be able to take this project on the road now and go to more towns and continue to grow and make more for this gallery series. And I'll take you with me. So these may come out maybe once a month as much as I can make them and produce them and process film and show you the final photograph. So it's a treat. It's a real treat to be able to go out with the large camera work and really take my time and create an image that I saw every portion of it and I chose what was in and what wasn't and how it should look for the final photograph. These photographs will end up being printed, hand printed, and then put into a gallery show. So I also look forward to doing the print work and that print I think is going to look better than anything you can even see online because there's nothing like seeing a 16 by 20 or whatever size print it ends up being from a four by five negative. Really on, made on black and white paper in a real dark room, oh, that's just incredible. So thanks for joining me and we'll go make photos again soon. Here's the good light. <laughs>